Hey everyone, Wes here. Welcome back to another Design Patterns video. We're working our way through all of the design patterns in the Gang of Four Design Patterns book. That's this book here. We are currently working through the creational patterns and in this video we're going to take a look at what is perhaps the most infamous pattern, some might say anti-pattern, and that is of course the singleton pattern. This is a creational pattern which has the unique distinction among all of the other patterns in the Gang of Four book really as being an anti-pattern. Uh, say what you will about the patterns and design patterns as a whole. I think probably the singleton pattern itself has the most nefarious reputation uh, for being an anti-pattern. Let's look at some of the motivations though for why the pattern may have existed in the first place. We're gonna look at a real world example with code in C-sharp uh, with some real business logic using food related examples, which is sort of the theme on the way that we are approaching uh, these design patterns. Be sure to check a link in the description for the GitHub repo for all of the patterns. There are console apps for each of them, including the singleton pattern. And be sure to like and subscribe if you're getting anything out of this series. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in and take a look at the singleton pattern, its definition, motivations, and how we can implement it in C Sharp. All right, so let's dive in and talk about the singleton pattern. This is a creational pattern. Um, as you may know, we've been working through the creational patterns first in from the Gang of Four book. Um, the singleton pattern, as mentioned, comes with a sort of special distinction of being considered by many to be an anti-pattern. We'll look at the motivations for the singleton pattern. We'll look at the definition, of course, and we'll look at the implementation of the singleton pattern in a real world example. I'll leave it up to you after we look at the example and talk about some of the drawbacks, whether or not you consider it to be an anti-pattern in general. Uh, let me know in the comments how you feel about the singleton pattern, whether or not you think it sort of deserves a place among the other patterns, um, and whether or not you think it's a code smell. So really the singleton pattern is a creational pattern that just ensures that a class has only one instance and that it provides a global point of access to that instance. So it's a creational pattern. It shares this in common with, say, our factory method, our abstract factory, our prototype, and our builder patterns. Uh, but the singleton pattern distinguishes itself by really asserting that there's only ever one single instance of some particular class and that there's a global point of access to it from that class. So effectively what we're talking about here is providing some type of global static access to a resource that's available across all contexts in our application. And already if you hear someone talking about global static access to some resource, uh, you, you may uh, feel some red flags uh, being raised there already with such a statement. Um, if you've spent any time working with dependency injection perhaps to solve some of your unit testing problems or your refactoring problems, uh, if you've worked on loosely coupling uh, classes from each other and programming to an interface uh, so that you can sort of easily swap out dependencies, you may hear things like static access to some resource and think to yourself, well that's really going to tightly couple us to that resource. And uh, you're exactly right, and that's sort of one of the main reasons why the singleton pattern um, is considered an anti-pattern. It is a way that provides static access to some resource, and uh, by being this static resource, uh, we can really hide a lot of sort of nefarious logic within that particular resource. We can do uh, network I.O. or file system I.O., and there's no way to sort of decouple those types of operations from the clients that use uh, the singleton. And so that can prove to be a problem. We can look at that explicitly in the code. Uh, the other thing that kind of comes to mind here is you hear about global state. We'll talk more about that in a little bit, but that's also one that you uh, may know from practice uh, can lead to um, a lot of bugs due to the indeterminate nature of uh, methods which manage some shared state and aren't purely functional. We can talk about that a little bit. Um, but those are some of the things that may come to mind when you hear about the singleton pattern. But basically, by hiding the code that constructs a new instance of some class within that class itself, we can write custom public instantiation code within the class to ensure that access to any instance returns the same single instantiation. 
This is kind of a long-winded way of saying we're going to have a private constructor. So we're going to prevent clients from being able to say, I want a new singleton object thing. Uh, instead, we're going to write what is effectively um, a public constructor, but we're going to do that by means of a static property and that is going to basically contain the private logic for returning that single instance or creating it if it doesn't already exist. All right, so here's the warning. We kind of, I kind of just went through a little bit of the warning. Um, we talk about global state, particularly, or I should say, really when we're talking about mutable global state, uh, that is certainly a smell. I say it can can be a smell. Many people would consider that in general just bad. Uh, bad practice, having some mutable global state. Um, as mentioned, if let's say method A is sharing global state with method B, and we have let's say an order going through our system, we're managing orders for some reason, and we have this shared state order that is um, accessed globally through all the context of our application and lives for the lifetime of our application in this simple example. Method A changes that global state and then sometime down the line, method B accesses the global state um, and maybe changes it itself. Uh, the thing here is that with these types of methods that are sharing this state, uh, A can basically do whatever it wants with the global state, mutating it in any infinite number of ways. When that state is accessed by method B, uh, method B uh, can really do little to make assertions about how that state has changed and therefore it can be very difficult to uh, write these methods in such a way that they always collaborate well um, and it's also often difficult to test these types of methods. They're not functional, uh, they're sharing and they're creating side effects and they're sharing global state. Uh, so we can look at that and uh, we can get into more detail about that a bit later. But let's like, take a look at some code now and look at how the singleton will be implemented in C Sharp and one plausible possible use case for it. Okay, so we're gonna be looking in the project here. Again, all the code for this and all the other patterns throughout the series. Uh, there's a link to that in the description. We're gonna look in the creational patterns project, the singleton namespace. There's just one class in here called ingredients, ingredients DB connection pool. In the creational examples and the example programs, we're gonna look at the ingredients database client. So the concept here is that we have a database connection pool. This is a bit hand wavy, but it the, conceptually what we do here is we have a connection pool that's going to manage connections to our ingredients database. This is used by say any number of clients to retrieve uh, information about ingredients for recipes, let's say. All right, so we have this class, ingredients DB connection pool. We see some backing fields here for it. It's going to be managing some number of open connections, and its responsibility is going to be able is going to be to accept connections to a database, uh, count how many open connections there are against that database, and then have some logic that sort of um, that sort of uh, intercepts connection calls to prevent too many connections from the database uh, from being made. So it's basically going to manage connections for us and hold global state in the form of these, this uh, number of open connections. So let's first look at the one of the crucial features of the singleton, which is the private constructor. So here we have a private ingredients DB connection pool constructor. It's taking its dependencies here as arguments. So we have maybe some abstract database class here. This could also be an interface. We have an interface for our logger and we're using those uh, dependencies to get past and setting them to backing fields on our, on our ingredients DB connection pool instance. Then we have a public static, uh, effectively a property here, which is going to be returning the uh, underscore instance dot value. So what is this underscore instance? Well, the way that this works is we're going to be leveraging a .NET uh, generic type called lazy. Uh, we provide the type of the class that we have here, which is our ingredients DB connection pool. And this is going to do a few things for us. Uh, first of all, it's going to be using lazy instantiation. So we're not actually going to create an instance of this until it needs to be used. Uh, which is a nice thing. We don't allocate resources that we don't need if we never actually need to use them. 
Uh, secondly, this provides thread safety, which is something else that we always have to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, shared resources, particularly in multi-threaded contexts. So this is going to sort of take care of both of those aspects for us. Uh, no matter what context we receive value from, uh, it's always going to return the same instance, and it's going to do that in a lazily instantiated manner. So this is going to new up our dependencies and return us this ingredients DB connection pool, but it, it's always going to return us the same instance. By having a private constructor, we're also never able to say that we want a new ingredients DB connection pool in any context. So we're always going to access it statically by calling ingredients DB connection pool dot instance. And this is going to delegate that to the value of our lazily loaded single instance. Okay, it contains the business logic as well here. Uh, this basically uh, has a method connect, which is going to delegate or proxy connections to a database. Uh, so it's going to call on the database that it's managing, call connect for a particular client and increment the number of connections. And we have a way to disconnect from the database and decrement the number of connections. Uh, so this in no way models uh, I would say like an actual DB connection pool. Um, I just wanted to provide a simple concept with a very basic public API in which we're managing um, uh, some global state and uh, generally have the same type of API that you might have with a connection pool, a very simple one, um, which, which I should reiterate does not actually uh, particularly model the way a connection pool should work. All right, so let's go back into our program, or we go to our program now. This is an ingredients database client. So like all of the other examples here, we have a simple console application. And as you can see here, what's happening is we're going to emulate the fact that we may have different clients. I'm going to run this all on a single thread and in a single process. Um, but we are accessing our ingredients DB connection pool statically on the name of the class and then calling dot instance. As we saw, that's going to, as mentioned, delegate that to the instance value, which is this lazily loaded single instance of an ingredients DB connection pool. So conceptually what's happening here is that we have four different clients, but they're all sharing the same resource. Um, so the pattern is creational in the sense that the resource gets created, um, but we're not creating a new one every time we make a call to uh, to access this resource, we're always going to get the same instance of that resource back. There's a single object, and effectively we're granting access to it uh, through this static um, property. All right, so each of our clients can call connect with their own particular IDs. We can disconnect and connect any number of times. Our DB connection pool is going to be managing the number of instances that are connected to it through that global state, and it's going to contain its own business logic for effectively denying uh, connections beyond a certain threshold. So it'll throw this or it'll log this error out for us. So let's go ahead and just run this and, uh, and watch it in action. So here we are connecting to our database. We can see our different clients are connecting to the database and uh, we can see that we can't acquire a new connection beyond three, uh, beyond two actually, so max connections of three is met or exceeded. Um, and then we're disconnecting from the database. And then our session is complete. So what's happening is when each of these clients connects, it's getting the same object as we saw, and we're just doing that uh, through uh, using that static property. Uh, let's very briefly now think about why this can actually be kind of a bad idea in many cases. Um, well, we talked about unit testing. So one of the things you'll hear when uh, writing unit tests from maybe people who have written a lot of unit tests or done a lot of refactoring is we hear about this concept of static cling. And static cling is the idea that when you invoke static access to some dependency, in this case our database connection pool, when you have static access here, you are entirely bound to the behavior of this precise class. I have no way of testing this method with a different implementation, say a mock implementation, for instance, of an ingredients DB connection pool, um, basically because I don't have an object to work with. I'm accessing this single object here statically. 
So if I were to go into the instance here, we know that it's going to new up a particular logger, a particular database, and it's going to handle all of the instantiation logic while also handling all of its own business logic. So there's another thing that may raise a little bit of a red flag when you hear about the single responsibility principle. This class is responsible for its instantiation and configuration as well as all of its business logic. We have no way when testing to actually separate those things out. So I have no way to say I don't actually want to connect to this particular database uh, that the concrete ingredients connection pool is instantiating here and, and using with this new database and a particular configuration connection string. I have no way of sort of intercepting that call if I wanted to test uh, a method that basically makes use of this singleton. Um, so already if you're trying to think about unit testing and being able to swap out uh, test doubles here for the ingredients DB connection pool, you're not really going to be able to do that here, um, certainly not very easily. We could always write integration tests, of course, um, and ensure that in some particular context uh, the behavior works as expected at that level. We have no way of testing the business logic independently here, uh, unfortunately due to some static cling. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, when we talk about global state, that's also sort of a related problem here. Um, if for some reason, let's say, this particular method call is uh, in some really complex business logic and there are a number of different things connecting and disconnecting from our database, uh, we know that the instance here has some mutable state on it, this number of open connections. And so this is sort of a trivial example, but uh, this shared state basically guarantees, the shared mutable state basically uh, ensures that we have absolutely no idea or very little idea how uh, that state is going to, uh, what particular state that's going to exist in, in any particular context. Okay, so that's it for the singleton pattern. What do you think about the singleton pattern? Do you think it deserves the reputation it has as an anti-pattern? Have you ever used it in any real world applications of your own? Um, what do you think about it in general? Has it stood the test of time with the other patterns or is it uh, generally a code smell and something to be avoided? All right, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click like and subscribe if you're enjoying this series. Stay tuned for another design pattern in the series, which will be released very soon. I'll see you around.